Uh, but as far as why this topic should be important to you, employee misuse of social media can have all sorts of, you know, negative impacts on, on you as an employer, on your workplace, operational issues, and so on. Uh, it may have an employee with, through social media posts engaging in conduct that violates your anti-discrimination policy or your anti-harassment policy, and thereby creating a hostile work environment. Uh, it's possible that the misuse by the employee on social media may impact negatively your reputation as an entity. Um, the social media use may, whether intentionally or not, uh, divulge confidential and proprietary information and, and causing ripple effects of a negative nature from there. Or, or the social media misused by an employee uh, may constitute hate speech or some form of speech that runs contrary to your business interests, whatever that might be. And so what are some of the risks associated with employee misuse of social media? Loss of clients, loss of patients, loss of customers. In terms of patients, we had one uh, about two weeks ago. It's a medical practice. Uh, they reached out to us because one of their employees was posting on social media uh, words that on any, any objective level one would deem to be hate speech, uh, offensive, and patients were calling up, you know, who had access to social media saying, look, we're going elsewhere uh, if you're going to employ somebody who posts those kinds of words. I'm not going to get into the details, but you get the point. It can lead to loss of revenue, harm to your reputation, loss of productivity. Uh, we're going to talk about social media use during work hours, which may be permitted by an employer, but uh, a misuse of access to social media during working hours can cause a loss of you know, productivity. Um, you can also run into inappropriate conduct by employees. The social media sites these days uh, often are, are used by employees to communicate with one another outside of the workplace. But then you're going to get those times when a certain line or threshold is crossed into harassing, threatening, discriminating, or, or other unlawful conduct that can subject an employer to liability. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, if an employee, again, intentionally or not, doesn't make a difference at what the effect is going to be divulges confidential or proprietary information, what are some of the cascading negative effects that can happen there? It may result in you as an employee, your breach of a confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement. It may end up with you being held liable for violating the terms of a confidentiality agreement between you as the employer and a third party, causing you to be in breach. It may cause you as an employer or an entity to lose protections of proprietary intellectual property rights. Another potential risk of misuse is an overreaction by you as the employer to the social media use of your employee, which can subject you to liability for wrongful discipline. Uh, finally, and we're going to touch upon this but briefly later on, uh, you also have to be very careful when you step in and react to social media postings because uh, some of those postings may be protected under, national, under the National Labor Relations Act or, or federal or state whistleblower laws, uh, such as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So there's a lot of risk associated with what goes on and how you respond to it. So in light of those risks, it's important for you as an employer to understand fully the legal landscape concerning employee social media use in order to minimize the risks and to be in a position to respond properly and effectively should misuse occur. And today's program is designed to assist you in that regard. Um, and given the, the, the current climate with so many global events of magnitude taking place and, and reactions to those events, uh, it's become of even more uh, importance. Uh, please note that we're only focusing on the private employment context uh, there are different standards applicable with regard to public and governmental employers. All right, everybody. Well, welcome again. I'm Miriam and Roy. And uh, I just want to say quickly before we kick off with the substantive part, uh, remember, if you have any questions, put it in the chat box. I know we were a little bit garbled in the beginning, so if you didn't hear that, just put your questions. We're happy to take them in the uh, chat box. The chat box will also, at the end, have a link for you to get CLE credit. So I'm not sure if you heard that at the beginning of the program, but that's where you'll get your forms yes. uh, for CLE. 
So the first thing I want to just touch upon briefly um, in the slide presentation here is what is social media. I think most of us know what it is uh, in this day and age, but basically any digital technology, right, that allows you to create, share, use, um, uh, uh, spread opinions or insights over the Internet or mobile devices, you know, your phone, your tablet, your laptop, anything like that. Uh, there are various social media platforms. We gave you a list of the um, more frequently used ones or the ones that come up a lot, especially when we're dealing with complaints about social media. They're usually on one of these uh, six or seven. I know Twitter is now X, so we should have, uh, we'll, we'll call that X now. Uh, Snap probably on the, be on there too. We, we get them here and there. Uh, as some of you may have attended some of our seminars in the past, especially like sexual harassment, I used to always say, look, we're not the Facebook police. Uh, our clients are, and the employers are not the Facebook police or the social media police, but things do come to the employer's attention that warrants or requires them to act. So when we give leadership and management training, we always say, look, be careful about what you post. It isn't necessarily unlawful or illegal, but it can have really uh, widespread implications, okay? So with that, I'm going to move over to the next slide. Maybe. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. Okay. So with starting with um, the first part of the analysis, right? When you're looking at um, a social media post that came to your attention or concern, uh, as an employer, and you're trying to decide, okay, um, what's my ability to restrict um, social media use or a particular post? What's the starting point for this, right? So I usually look at or tell clients, it's like, yes, yeah, you have, in most instances, employees are at will, right? Unless there's a contract or something specific in a CBA or a union contract. Uh, so even with an at-will employment uh, relationship, there are still restrictions that you have to deal with, caveats. So while I can terminate an at-will employee for any reason or no reason, I can't do it for an unlawful reason, a discriminatory reason, okay? Uh, so the employment at-will principle, like on its face, the private sector has broad latitude to uh, terminate an employee if they feel that a social media post is offensive, okay? but there are still some state caveats that we have to deal with. But from an at-will perspective, you know, you have latitude. Now, even with contracts, you're going to have latitude because most of us who have seen employment contracts, there's going to be language in those contracts that say you violate policies or procedures. So if you do something that's offensive or inappropriate conduct or sexual harassment or illegal, right, those are things that you could still act upon uh, uh, with regard to a con uh, contract employee, okay. So the next thing we look at, and it's shocking to many people, including myself when I came across this some years ago, was that, look, First Amendment in the private workplace, you know, you don't have any First Amendment protection for private employees. And that's kind of surprising. Most people say, I can post whatever I want. I'm a, you know, U.S. citizen. I can, you know, spew whatever information I want. That's misguided, okay? So, again, from the First Amendment standpoint, uh, there will even be protections, but from a state law standpoint, and we're going to get into some of those state laws in a few seconds, right, there still can be some constraints that we have to be mindful of. Now, there are some states that have absolutely no con uh, constraints and no law that really touches upon uh, free speech. And in those jurisdictions, the employer, the private employer, would have even more latitude to take action against an employee for offensive social media posts. So the next thing we're going to talk about is what codified law exists, and I'm going to turn it over to Andy to uh, talk about the next thing. And, and what we're going to do is we're focusing on Jersey and Florida. We're going to talk about Connecticut and, and New York just to give you some contrast. So like Marianne said, each state's different. Mm -hmm. uh, you really need to examine the codified law in the particular jurisdiction to see what those differences may be. So New Jersey and Florida are two examples of what Marianne was talking about. Neither state has specific laws protecting employees from discipline uh, in response to uh, comments posted on private you know, social media. 
So you say, oh, that's great. I have unfettered authority to just swoop in as an employer and deal with this. The answer is to see Marianne's line. Yeah, you have more latitude, but uh, towards the tail end of the program, we're going to discuss certain pitfalls if you step wrong, uh, even in the absence of codified law constraints on your ability to react and respond. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. Now, by way of contrast, you, you're going to see the buildup here. Um, right. Connecticut, yeah. All right. So, Connecticut, uh, general, Connecticut General Statute 31-51Q deals with the liability of employer for discipline or discharge of employee on account of employee's exercise of certain constitutional rights. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, exception. Except as provided in subdivision C and D of this section, any employer, including the state and any instrumentality or political subdivision thereof, who subjects or threatens to subject any employee to discipline or discharge on account of one, the exercise by such employee of rights guaranteed by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, provided such activity does not substantially or materially interfere with the employee's bona fide job performance or the working relationship be the, between the employee and the employer shall be liable to such employee for damages caused by such discipline or discharge. And it goes on to read what you can see on the screen. Um, God bless those who write these statutes. Um, no wonder you need lawyers to try and interpret them the, the, the way they're written. But essentially, under Connecticut law, an employee is liable for compensatory and punitive damages as well as attorney's fees and costs where an employee is disciplined or discharged on account of the exercise by the employee of, of, of their constitutional rights, whether it's the U.S. Constitution or the Connecticut Constitution. And in Connecticut, to recover damages, the statute also requires the employee to show that the alleged protected speech does not substantially or materially interfere with the employee's, as it is written there, bona fide job performance or the working relationship between the employee and the employer. Uh, Connecticut courts have made it rather clear that Section 31-51Q does not protect all types of speech. And, for example, it should not be you know, construed as to transform every dispute about working conditions into a constitutional question. So what does all this language mean in practical terms? A prerequisite according to the courts to the statute's application is that the speech at hand or the, in the center of the dispute must be constitutionally protected. Under Connecticut law to be protected by the First Amendment, the speech must address a matter of public concern and the employee's interest in expressing himself or herself or their self must not be outweighed by any injury caused by the speech. There's a balancing test that we're going to talk about. Uh, what is a statement of public concern? That would include statements that can be fairly considered as relating to any matter of political or social or other concern to the community, and the word public. Uh, it's up to the court to determine whether speech addresses a matter of public concern. Uh, a court's going to look at the content, the form, the context in which the, the statement is made, uh, basically look at the totality of the circumstances in, in making that assessment and, and drawing that conclusion. Uh, importantly, Connecticut courts have held that Section 31-51Q requires that the employee's right to speak is not be outweighed by the employer's interest in the effective operation of the workplace. That's the balancing test. The employee is going to have certain protections in terms of statements that can be made, but if those comments are outweighed by the injury to the employer, the scale is going to be tipped in favor of a restraint on that particular speech. In other words, the impact on the employer is a critical component of the legal analysis at hand. And with regard to that analysis, what are some of the variables that the courts are going to look at when they conduct this balancing test? They're going to look, for example, uh, in terms of the disruption caused by the speech, the, you know, what's the impact on workplace discipline? What's the impact on harmony among coworkers? Uh, we had talked about earlier about comments that may make coworkers feel unsafe or uncomfortable. Uh, what's the impact on working relationships? What's the impact on the employee's job performance? 
what are the responsibilities of the employee within the, the entity, uh, and whether the speech is made publicly or privately. So there's a, a, a list of variables that will go into that equation in conducting that balancing test. Uh, and as Marianne will discuss next, this framework is, is very consistent with the way New York law is structured. All right, so I'm going to review some of the applicable New York law. Uh, so at issue is New York law, labor law 201-D. Uh, the law is written out on the, on the screen. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. Uh, but unless provided uh, by law, basically it's unlawful for an employer or an employment agency, right, to refuse to hire or discharge or affect the terms or conditions of employment because of one of several things, okay? And New York is very limited in what it protects, okay? So if you are uh, penalizing someone from an employment standard, standpoint because of an individual's, number one, an individual's political activity when they are um, outside of working hours, okay, off-premises and without use of the employer's uh, equipment or property, okay? Uh, assuming these activities are legal, right? And there are a few exceptions in there for like news and media. There's some um, uh, subsections over there for newspaper, media, or journalists, and government executive offices, all right? Or two, uh, if you're penalizing an employee because of their individual recreational activity, okay? And where we have seen this come up even before social media, was in um, like smoking in the workplace. Uh, now it's cannabis, right? So cannabis is legal in uh, so in states, at least on a state level, uh, or in many states, right? So penalizing someone because they happen to vape cannabis or use different uh, products that uh, an employer may find offensive or against their own personal morale, right? You wouldn't be able to penalize them as long as it's done off premises and off hours and not using their equipment and whatnot. So this statute has been used or applied to social media posts as well. All right, so we have to start somewhere when looking at this and we get the intake of, an, of a client saying, look, you know, I have this issue with a particular activity or social media post or some kind of conduct, right? The first thing we're going to look at is were the posts made during work, right? Were they on work hours, whether they are at home, you know, working remotely or during uh, or at the office, okay? Were they made using the employer's equipment, computers, cell phone devices, things like that, okay? Because this statute is going to um, give the employer more latitude if the person is engaging on in the offensive conduct during business hours, okay? The second thing we're going to look at, or the next thing we're going to look at, is does the social media post constitute a political activity or a recreational activity? So let me move on to the next slide here. So the labor law also defines what political activities can include. And in New York, it is very limited, okay? One, two, and three. Running for public office, campaigning for a candidate for public office, uh, participating in fundraising events for a, a candidate, a political uh, party, or advocacy group, okay? So, you know, something where people are supporting, um, and I've had this come up, well, I support Ukraine, or I support Russia, right? That's not going to fall under political activities. It might be some political opinion, but it's not going to be protected speech if you're picking a side in uh, various world events, okay? And again, there are some caveats there Andrew and I will go uh, to as well. All right. So, um, you know, and, and the way this law has been interpreted, uh, there's some rigid uh, uh, statutory construction rules that are put into place. And, you know, the, 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 the way the case law has come out and said, look, you know, the fact that the legislature specified three examples, it means there are only three examples. There is a little bit of case law out there that talks about, well, the examples are really more of a guideline, so it could be a little bit more expansive. So uh, there is some room or some gray area for when we're looking at political type of posts on social media and whether or not that will become case law in the future and people are going to put that to the test, I don't know. 
Uh, but, you know, so things where, for example, there was a case in 2013, uh, New York Supreme Court, a Chinese political activist, he was putting a lot of social media and or engaged in a lot of political activities, right, uh, in support of, of uh, certain Chinese-related um, activities. And the court found, look, this doesn't fall within one of the categories. It's not protected. And so, you know, even the complaint didn't allege that he was engaged in any of the three categories of political activity. So the complaint was dismissed, all right? So... And, and just to give you some specifics about the activities that he was engaging in that fell outside of the three Mary Ann just walked He had joined movements. He had organized mm -hmm. protests. He had published articles and given speeches calling for democracy in China and criticizing the Chinese government, you know, and, and that was the activity that the court deemed to be outside of that definition of political activities, uh, and therefore he was unprotected. Right, right. Now, we've had in the past even some prior elections when Trump was running, probably will run again, or is running again, um, where it, there was some dispute, okay, this person's posting pro-Trump, or let's say pro-Biden, and People didn't like it, anyone here. So you have to look at it. Okay, so are they doing it during work or is it on their, their own time, right? Because arguably, you know, uh, advocating for different political candidates and let's say they were campaign campaigning for them through social media, that would be protected so long as they weren't disrupting the workplace doing it during work hours. So again, you have to look at all the facts and that could be coming up in the near future again, an influx of those types of, 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 of complaints or issues concerning political uh, speech right now. And, and just to briefly interject and, and piggyback on what Marianne just said, you know, what we're discussing today is your authority as an employer to act, mm -hmm. whether you can take certain action in response to social media posts, you know, from a legal standpoint, but pragmatism is always going, or should be anyway, infused into your analysis on what to do because, uh, you know, you may get someone saying, I'm rooting for the blue team versus the purple right. team versus the yellow team, whatever the issue may be, where you may say, you know what, it, it falls outside of political activity, so I can put a stop to that. But you might not want to in a given context because you may say, you know what, I'm going to let people – air their thoughts and their positions. It's not impacting the workplace. It's not un undermining the mission of, of, of my entity and so on. So, you know, carefully distinguish between the Friday Act and whether it's prudent or good judgment to act in a given situation. You know, cover both components uh, of that, that thinking. Exactly. And then the uh, last part of the inquiry, or uh, we're going to look at, let me flip to the next slide here, uh, whether or not the social media post or the activity in question constitutes recreational activity, okay, legal recreational activity. So that would be what we're talking about, smoking, cannabis, things of that nature. So if people are posting about those types of things, there might be some quote of protection uh, uh, about their participation in those types of things. And that can include, you know, sports, games, hobbies, exercise, reading, you know, as the statute says, movies, similar material, okay? Uh, the courts have also distinguished social activities from interesting recreational activities. Uh, and in doing so, they rejected the idea that um, extramarital affairs is a recreational activity. I guess that's more of a social activity. So, again, it's just interesting how some of these courts are looking at these things, but, but it is important to keep in mind. All right, and so you're going to talk about the safe harbor? Yep. Okay, what else we got? Safe harbor provision is uh, under Labor Law 201-D3A, and, and this parallels in many respects the Connecticut um, law that we just went through minutes ago, uh, where you're conducting this balancing test and the impact of the speech, uh, even if it does constitute uh, a matter of public concern, the, the impact of that speech on the workplace, on the employer. Uh, New York has uh, that parallel in, in this particular provision, uh, saying that even if something is deemed to be political activity or, or recreational activity, it shall not be deemed to, be, to protect activity which creates a material conflict of interest 
<clears throat> related to the employer's trade secrets, proprietary information, or other proprietary or business interests. So, therefore, assuming that social media comments do constitute political activity or do constitute recreational activity, that doesn't end the inquiry. You then go to this next level of analysis, uh, the safe harbor provision, uh, in order to see, well, what's the impact? Well, what's the impact on the, uh, the workplace? What's the impact on the employer? Uh, and this means that an employer has the authority to discipline an employee for social media comments where the posts are deemed by the employer to be detrimental to the uh, workplace or to the employer or other, otherwise impact the employee's job performance. In terms of what does material conflict of interest mean in actual terms, uh, it, it's unclear. Um, you know, uh, the, the question that is raised is whether or not it means that the employer has you know, broad latitude in deciding what comments may create, may create a material conflict of interest, or does it mean something narrower? For example, that to show a material conflict of interest, the employee has to point to some tangible or provable harm or impact. Um, the limited case law that exists points to the former conclusion, that it's really, um, you know, again, with good faith involved and so on, it's an employer-based decision. Um, there's one uh, relevant case uh, whose underlying facts uh, can only be found through secondary sources. You really have to, you know, go through a bunch of hoops to find out what the facts were, ultimately in the news article. Uh, the basic facts of this case are that the employee worked for the German National Tourist Office and was terminated for Holocaust denial associations and on the ground, uh, in the view of the employer, that the uh, Holocaust denial conflicted with the business interest of the German National Tourist Office. Uh, that interest involved promoting tourism in Germany and, and German culture, and, and, and those postings were deemed to be detrimental to that mission. Uh, the termination decision was upheld by the courts, including the appellate division, uh, and there was no indication uh, that the court required some tangible proof of an impact to the operations or reputation of the German National Tourist Office before finding the termination proper. So there is case law that, that supports the conclusion. You're an employer. Uh, you know, I referenced earlier that case where a medical practice um, was receiving complaints by patients saying we won't come there uh, if so-and-so is still employed there. Yeah, you can say, well, you don't know that the patients stopped coming there. You don't have to prove that. Um, you know, is, 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 you know, our conclusion based upon what we've read. Uh, there is a, a non-Labor Law 201-D case in a different context, one dealing with public employees and, and conduct, not social media posts, uh, that further supports this conclusion. Uh, the facts are, are pretty disturbing. Uh, the case is Locurdo versus Giuliani uh, and other named defendants, and it involved a police officer and a couple of firefighters who were terminated based upon their participation in a Labor Day parade and creation of a float that was highly racially discriminatory. Um, I'm going to share with you the details to give you how compelling these facts were and, and just how uh, it was handled by the courts. Um, the float they entered in the 1998 parade was called Black to the Future, Broad Channel 2098. Uh, it was a, the float was a play on the 1985's time travel film, Back to the Future, um, which depict, attempted to depict how Broad Channel um, would look in 2098 uh, when presumably the community would be more integrated than it was in 1998. Each of the float participants, including the plaintiffs, had covered their faces in black lipstick, had donned Afro wigs, and accompanied the float along the possession and attire ranging from overalls with no T-shirt underneath, uh, cut-off jeans. Uh, the float itself featured two buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken on the hood of a flatbed truck. Uh, one of the participants, not the plank, one of the plaintiffs uh, in the case, uh, ate a watermelon and threw the remains into the crowd uh, near the end of the procession. And apparently, without the others' knowledge, is one of the named uh, one of the firefighters or, or police officer held on to the truck's tailgate pretending to be dragged by the truck and yelled, look what they did to our brother in Texas. We would not allow them here. Uh, and that was recreating the horrifying uh, dragging death of James Byrd, uh, if you all remember that. 
uh, from back during that time frame. A ton of press coverage, as one would imagine, and the three were terminated. And you listen to those facts, and there were more, but you don't have to hear all of the facts to understand um, how awful that this was, right? They then sued, claiming in part that they had been disciplined in retaliation for their exercise of First Amendment rights. And remarkably, after a bench trial, the lower court reinstated them. The Second Circuit, however, reversed, and stating in part, and, and this relates to our position that you don't have to prove a tangible impact mm -hmm. to the speech. The mm -hmm. Second Circuit said, where a government employee's job quintessentially involves public contact, the government may take into account the public's perception of that employee's expressive acts in determining whether those acts are disruptive to the government's operations. Furthermore, the disruption need not be actual. A public employer may legitimately respond to a reasonable prediction of disruption. And that quote helpfully inform, informs our analysis uh, of whether private employees, again, that was in the public employment context, look at the, the strength of the, the position of the Second Circuit on this issue, uh, informs our analysis of whether private employers must prove some tangible harm based on social media posts in order to discipline uh, an employee. Uh, the Second Circuit went on to add in, in other language that's helpful to this issue. Uh, defendants, meaning the, 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 the mayor at the time and the other defendants, interest in maintaining relationship of trust between African American community and police and fire departments outweighed expressive interests of police and fire department employees. Um, again, so they did a balancing test the strong lean, obviously, uh, was in favor of um, the termination. Okay. All right. So, uh, with all that legal background, right, there's some other variables to consider, right? Not codified in law, but there are things that uh, you really need to consider. Uh, most people who are posting offensive things, right, they're not doing it at work, let's face it, right? And they're doing it... Uh, fairly privately, they're not going to friend you if they think that, you know, if they know you're the boss, right, and let you know I'm posting all this horrific stuff. But as we all know, stuff leaks, right? And you as a supervisor or a manager or a leader of, a, of an organization, something's going to come your way. You're going to get a complaint, right? And you have to investigate it, especially when somebody is saying that complaint, I find offensive or hostile or threatening, I feel unsafe. And that's the influx of complaints that Andrew and I have been uh, dealing with lately. And, you know, variables, right? It's like looking at the law and say, okay, is it protected under the law? Are we constrained on how we handle this or look at it, right? Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is look at, all right, uh, right now we're getting a lot of the political speech, a lot of things dealing with Israel and Hamas. Um, and, okay, is it an opinion, right? Is it a threat or call to violence? Is it supporting or condoning the call to violence, right? Those are the things that, the two louder things, right? A threat of violence or supporting violence, those are the things that are going to put up all the red flags and like, look, we're going to have to take some action here. Uh, so, you know, when you're, when you're looking at this stuff and you're interviewing the complainant and you're finding out where did you get this material, who's the source of the material, is it a repost? Um, you know, some people inadvertently press like on things because it's their friends and don't even realize that they're pressing like on something that's horrific. Uh, so you're going to have to gather all of the, the facts. Um, the other thing I'm going to look at, okay, is it hate speech, right? Plain old-fashioned hate speech, right? So, you know, people that are posting things, KKK, plus stickers, a noose, right? Uh, things like that on social media, you're going to take action about that. Those are the, the clear-cut ones, okay? Other threats of speech, right? Uh, comments about genocide. Any, any comment that's going to say, you know, or, or promote genocide against any protected category, right? Jews, Muslims, Catholics, whoever it might be, you know, that's going to be hate speech. <coughs> and make people feel very unsafe in the workplace when the person that's sitting next to them is saying that they should be killed, right? And you're going to have to, you know, deal with that. Um, and we'll talk about how to handle that in a, in a moment of the different types of uh, disciplinary action. All right. 
do the comments result in a hostile work environment? Let's say it's not per se violence, right? But it's derogatory statements, stereotypes, sexual harassment type of things, right? Those are the things, again, you're going to have to look at. Even if it doesn't fall into one of the things under the law, you know, you still have to, or you know, take a look at how is it infecting your workplace. And I think that's what Andrew was saying before. And these are the ones that we're coming up with, uh, or we're being confronted with by our clients, right? Andrew talked about how is it negatively impacting the reputation of the organization, and, and I think he's spoken up about that quite a bit already, but, you know, you work for the NWACP and you're posting support for white supremacist groups. What do you think is going to happen? You know, you can't work for the NWACP uh, and do such, um, uh, participate in such activities. All right. Uh, do the comments give rise to criminal culpability, criminal liability, right? So you might get wind that you have somebody in your office who is looking at child pornography, right, using Internet sites and stuff. You will have to call the police, right? So there is a criminal element, too. Um, I mean, even if they're not using it on your web, on your computer network, and you find out that there are these posts out there, you may still want to contact the authorities and say, and you should. I mean, I would say, look, look, this came to my attention, and, you know, I would uh, ask the authorities to take action there. It might also be that you have a disgruntled worker, and somebody brings to your attention, so-and-so is threatening to, like, blow up the place, right? This is the criminal stuff. You have to be mindful of that, and in this day and age, not ignore those types of posts. And at the very least, you have to investigate them. There are times where people post ridiculous things and they're sarcastic and they meant them in jest or whatever, but it can have huge effects across your workplace where people are saying, I don't know if I want to come in today when someone just posted X, Y, and Z, right? That they, and they're saying, well, I jokingly said it. So you can have to take action with regards to those uh, types of posts. Defamatory posts, right? Uh, an employee calls another coworker a rapist or a pedophile, right? And it's not true. Obviously, to be defamatory, it has to be um, untrue. Uh, that might require um, uh, also contact to the authorities, or well as well as result in civil litigation. But certainly, for an employer to act upon things like that. Uh, now, the next thing I'm going to look at is how to handle it. So, no, there is no one size fits all. Uh, solution or results, right? So some of the things when you're talking about killing others, right, that's a termination, that's pretty clear. Some things are, okay, well, you know what, some people really felt uncomfortable and they, you know, maybe there's a lot of different opinions on a particular issue and you can counsel the employee and maybe they even volunteer to pull stuff down, right? And you, you can have some in between depending on the nature of the post and the effect on the work environment, right? Because my feeling, too, if you say you hate a particular protected group, right, and you want to see them all killed, whether or not you take down your post, I already know you feel that way. I don't care that you just took down your post, right? It, it, it doesn't change the end result of the, um, of the disciplinary action. The other thing that we've had clients do as well with social media posts or even email and text messages that are inappropriate, you can have a memo go around reminding people of professional communication, being sensitive to people's, you know, uh, uh, cultural diversity or background, things like that. So again, promoting that positive work environment. And I think we'll go on to the next. And in terms of, yeah, you've gone. Yeah, I forgot the uh, written policies as well. Yeah. One of the other bullet points, you want to make sure that whatever, the, if the conduct that is being uh, complained about violates your policies, you're going to have something right there that you can counsel, discipline, document, you know, so if the person's engaging in an unprofessional to hate speech, right, you're going to be able to act in accordance with your policies. But, and you can see as Mary Ann and I are talking, you know, the, the different levels of analysis is when confronted by an issue of this type. You know, if the employee posts something on social media, the first step is, is it protected speech, right? There's no First Amendment rights, but depending upon the state, there may be some protected speech. You know, Connecticut, a matter of public concern, New York, political or recreational activity. 
oh, even if it is protect, if it's not protected speech, do what you want, right? Um, I mean, it, it, you can't be discriminatory, but as far as latitude and disciplining, you, you can then respond. But even if it does fall within protected speech, then you have the safe harbor provision, which encompasses many of the variables that Mary Ann just went through. So that, you know, that's the basic you know, framework and how to analyze these things. So best practices, one, create, implement, and enforce a social media policy. Uh, having a properly drafted and enforced policy on the use of social media uh, by employees is a very effective tool in protecting yourself uh, against legal uh, liability and harm to your reputation and goodwill from any misuse by your employees. You know, have a policy in which you plainly set forth your expectations for employee use of social media. Uh, you either have a standalone policy or put it in your handbook, but be clear about where the lines are. Be clear about what you encourage or discourage. Uh, and in many cases, if you have a good policy, no different than if you have a good handbook to point to, or, or any policy for that matter, you know, that, that tends to keep people, or more likely to keep people inside their lanes uh, when acting. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all, make a, a draft a policy that fits your workplace. Uh, to the extent you as an employer permit employees to access social media for workplace purposes, uh, some of the factors that you should consider as an employer in creating a social media policy um, should include, you know, recognizing there's no duty of privacy when the employees are using your equipment and accessing social media. Uh, you have to assess what is your level of tolerance as an employer for personal use of social media uh, during, during the workday, maybe during the break and so on. You should decide uh, whether or not you should permit or even require the use of social media uh, for various workplace purposes. You should decide beforehand how you're going to handle employees who post something that might be deemed inappropriate. Um, you know, how you as an employer are going to com comply with laws that protect the employee's right to engage in, in certain conduct and so on. So you want to take all of these variables into account um, when, when drafting your policy. Um, you want to remind the employees, as Marianne said, that, you know, postings on social media, uh, yes, it might be your private site and so on, but it's public and that you as an employer have a right to respond to postings of a certain, certain type. Um, you know, so again, having this policy in place is, is a critical, a critical uh, best practice. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at the time as well. Um, with regard to private use of social media, that should be addressed in your policy as well. You should stress, as we said before, that uh, even though that's off the clock and in your home and on your Facebook account or whatever the social media site of the moment may be, uh, it can't be used to, to violate policies such as sexual harassment policies. We have a whole mm -hmm. bunch of those direct messaging uh, that violate the sexual harassment policies. They can't violate a discrimination policy, but spell that out in your policy, right? So they understand that Again, it's, it's very much in the way that Marianne and I deal with cases of off-site sexual harassment. Oh, you left the, I left the workplace. I, wasn't, I was at the ball game when this happened. Well, what do you mean you can impose discipline? Well, we can do the same thing with the social media site. Uh, and you want to remind employees of that. Uh, you know, stress to employees in policy that they can't use social media to harass other employees. Um, include references. <clears throat> to social media and the anti-harassment policies and any training offered to prevent workplace harassment. Uh, ensure that your response to harassment is consistent with your response to harassment in non-social media posting context as well. Stress that discipline can be imposed. You know, we get those things. Yeah. I, I didn't know I can get fired for that. Well, they can, but let them know that. Again, you, your goal isn't to set them up to be disciplined. Your goal is to prevent the misconduct in, in the first place. Um, you want to, in that policy, prohibit employees from disclosing or misusing confidential or proprietary information. We talked earlier at the beginning of the program of, of the harm that can come from that. Uh, you want to let them know that they can be held responsible for that, and again, you know, that they need to take care not to identify patients 
or clients or customers, customers by name or to speak on behalf of the company. And if they do violate X, Y, and Z uh, protocols, there can be termination. <laughs> I'm just, uh, this slide is self-explanatory, but look, you can have all the policies in the world, but if you don't train your employees on it, uh, maybe it's during orientation or when you hand out the policies, and importantly, if you don't train your managers and supervisors, it, it really is ineffective, right? Especially if your managers or supervisors are violate, violating the very policies that you created. So you really want to train them, um, explain privacy rights, right? You're not allowed to go make up a fake uh, Facebook um, uh, persona so that you can infiltrate and see the posts of your uh, subordinate employees or coworkers and things like that. Uh, the other thing I want to mention too, just the employment lawyer, uh, even though it's not really social media posts per se, if you use social media in connection with screening people for hiring, be really careful about that because you may get access to information to which the employee didn't consent to as part of that background check. And or if you don't hire the person, they can potentially claim, well, you saw I was part of X, Y, and Z group, or you saw that I had a disability or a health condition, and then you didn't hire me. So really be careful about Googling people as part of your um, hiring practices. And then we're just going to touch upon a few of the pitfalls. Yeah. Um, okay. You want me to just start no, Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are some of the pitfalls? Uh, we've had instances where there's been some posting and we'll ask the client, well, how did you get to see the post? And they say, well, we heard about it. We called the employee. And we said, here's the laptop. We want you to access your social media site. Well, guess what? Uh, starting in March of 2024, in, in New York anyway, there's going to be a new law in, in the labor law that will bar employers from accessing an employee's social media account login information, such as usernames and passwords and so on. Um, under this new law, an employer will be barred from compelling the attorney, the attorney, uh, the employee to disclose any username and password or other authentication for accessing that personal account. It will bar uh, compelling the employee to access their personal account in the presence of the employer. It will bar uh, disciplining the employee for refusing to allow any of these delineated uh, prohibitions. Um, the employer can still, even under this new law, compel the employee to do these things with regard to non-personal and employer accounts and systems. But when it comes to private accounts, uh, there's going to be these firm uh, prohibitions. And, and the reason why this law was put into effect, uh, there were many instances, uh, at least in the minds of the New York legislature, where there were, you know, fairly, um, you know, uh, severe invasions of privacy, as the legislature felt, um, you know, as far as acting in that way. Uh, so on the one hand, you go, oh, well, that's really going to handicap me in some respect. The answer is no. Something's posted. They'll, they'll get access to it, lawful access to it. You just can't force the employee to give you that access. Uh, another pitfall? Of yeah, concerted activity. So I'm just going to touch upon this because uh, it's going to have its own class with, with you know, labor uh, attorneys here. But, you know, the National Labor Relations Act, Section 7, there's a right to, to organize, okay? And Section 8 of the NLRA, it's unlawful to interfere with, restrain, on uh, the right to organize guaranteed under Section 7, okay? So years back, uh, we were taking out the no negativity policies because in essence, employees couldn't be restrained from talking about the terms and conditions of their job. I don't like my pay, I'm not paid enough, or whatever it might be. I think it's unsafe walking down the hall with exposed uh, electrical, you know, uh, um, ducts, whatever it might be, okay? So those policies all went by the wayside. So there's still been, now there's more recent case law and discussion and opinions by the NLRB regarding social media restrictions and policies. So I'm just going to touch upon it as a red flag for you when you create those social media policies, and Andy was talking about it before, there are some caveats, right? They still need to be facially neutral as far as restricting 
an employee's ability to talk about terms and conditions yeah. of employment. Now, when an employee is engaging in concerted activity, it's really when they're speaking on behalf of themselves and at least one more person, right? Personal gripes that are just uh, uh, particular to a single employee is not concerted activity, okay? So uh, you have to be mindful of that. However, the NLRB has also noted that, look, if a social media post is reckless or malicious, right, regardless of whether or not they're talking about terms or conditions, uh, that's not, it's going to lose its protection. So if you're going to say, I'm going to kill my boss if he doesn't give me a raise on social media, you know what, you're going to lose your um, uh, concerted activity uh, protection. And just one other example is a, uh, a recent uh, case, let me just find it for you in a second, with uh, Trader Joe's, okay? And Trader Joe's had fired an employee, in fact, not that recent, 2021, who was putting on social media complaints about customers who just lingered around. And it was during the pandemic, and they felt it was rude of the, um, of the customers to just hang around the store, that they should just get in, get their stuff, and leave, okay? And so they were really um, going after the customers of Trader Joe's and other employees were liking it, and the NLRB said that the posts were unprotected, okay, because um, their intent was disloyal, reckless, and malicious, and untrue, and the intent was to disparage the employer rather than support a real labor dispute. So again, you have to look at everything as a whole, uh, but the NLRB does understand that there are business, legitimate business reasons where you're going to have to act upon those social media posts. And just lastly, and we'll just discuss this very quickly, uh, avoid a hasty and premature judgment of the facts. Don't overreact to information. Avoid the potential for overreacting. Conduct a proper in investigation into the allegations. You know, confirm the existence of the posts. I mean, it sounds rather obvious, but we've had situations where, oh, well, we were told that this was posted. Well, make sure that it actually was, and it's not a bad you know, game of telephone being played. Uh, don't overreact to public sentiment. Obviously, take that into account for what should be obvious reasons, uh, but confirm the existence and depth of that sentiment and the credibility of the sources of information. Uh, speak with the employee, as Mary Ann said earlier, speak with the employee who, who you know, uh, made the comments. Uh, they may not have much to add because the comments may speak for themselves uh, in a given instance. Uh, that said, while you shouldn't overreact or react too quickly without knowing the facts, you don't want to respond too slow uh, because it may give rise to the impression that you're not taking this seriously. Uh, if you react too slowly, uh, you can have retention issues. You can have morale issues. You can have productivity issues. Uh, you, you may lose customers, clients, patients, as the case may be. So it's not like there's some narrow line that is hard to discern in these situations. There's not necessarily a whole lot of factual depth. There's a post. You talk to a bunch of people, um, and you make a decision. It's not something that you take, like some of the investigations Marion and I conduct, where we interview 30 people, and it can go on for a bunch of weeks, and written reports, and so on. This is a lot simpler in, in terms of what you're being asked to do, but do it uh, in order to avoid making a mistake in, in handling this. And I think it's been a pleasure to be here uh, today to give you this presentation. Andrew's going to read the CLE code. I think I saw somebody ask if the slides would be made available. I believe that they will be, um, there will be a link for them as well as the CLE forms and some CLE materials as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. And, and most importantly, uh, the CLE code is S as in Sam, 1, 2, M as in Mary, 1, 3, Again, S is in Sam, one, two, M is in Mary, one, three. Yeah, and, and just so you know, too, I know we are out of time, actually a little over time. If anyone has questions, uh, feel free to reach one of us directly, and we're happy to, to chat further with uh, anyone who has questions. Otherwise, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Well. Sure. Yeah, I just want to see if anybody else will.